Amen. Today is my last message on this series, Overflow. Um, we prophesy, we believe for 2023, a year of overflow. And I, I believe this is the last brick for this foundation we are building for this year ahead. And the theme of my message today is overflow of life. We shared that God has overflow of fruits, overflow of peace, overflow of grace. But ultimately, the Lord has spilled over in amount that you can give away overflow of life. John chapter 10, verse 10 is a classic. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal. The thief, speaking of the devil, comes only to kill. The enemy of our souls, he has only one plan, a single plan every morning. It is to destroy. But I came that you may have life. Jesus did not come to destroy people, to condemn people. Jesus did not come to bring heavy yoke. No. He said he came that you and I may have life. Not just ordinary life. Not only enough life to survive another week, another year. But life overflowing. Say a good amen in this house. Come on, somebody. That is the type of life that Jesus is promising us. That he came to give. Now I know this concept of life is one of the hardest to define. Biology may define it as the pursuit of proliferation of the best genes to the next offspring. Philosophers, philosophers understand life as the metaphysics concepts. Such as being, knowing, causing, and identifying. In other words, they can't explain. In physics, when I used to be a physicist, we said that life is the interaction with light, which is the basic element of nature that makes anything exist. In other words, it's still they can't define it. But Jesus, he's promising Zoe. Say with me, Zoe. This is it's beyond with what any biologist, physicist, scientist, philosopher can ever define. In my Bible studies, I got the, this definition of the type of life Jesus is giving us. Zoe is the state of one who is possessed of vitality. Of absolute fullness of life. Both essential, ethical, a life that belongs to God and only flows through Him. If God brought everything into existence, so He is the very life. And Jesus is saying, I came to give you God's life. A life that this world does not have in themselves. Because the world came to exist from this life. But they don't have it to pass on. But Jesus is saying, I am God. And I came to give the life of God because I am God. I can give you this life. God called us to live days of joy, peace. It is the will of the Father that you live every single day under His blessings. Now, He is clearly saying that He is the very source of life. Because He is God. He is the very source of Zoe that brings life to everything else. Now, that means unless you are in relationship with Christ... There is no way to enjoy such life. Now, let me explain this in a 
a very uh, tangible, practical way. You know people that when you get around them, they are like a black hole. Like they are this drainage, this uh, life-sucking person. Like you get and start to talk about whatever subject. From uh, uh, the weather to uh, econ economics. Whatever is the subject. You speak to some people that they just drain your life. They just suck the life out of you. They are always negative. They are always complaining. There is something that just drag life out of you. They are heavy loaded. They are weigh, they weigh down the, the, the place, the atmosphere. But Jesus, he's saying that he is the source of every life. Jesus is saying that he has a lightweight life. I'm talking on people that walks with Jesus that when you talk to them, they have overflowing life that you feel as well. You feel talking to some people that just bring light in the environment. They take the heavy burden away. They bring relief. And even if the atmosphere is dark and gloomy, they change the place. They bring color. They bring joy. They are fun to be around. If there are people that can drag life and people that can give life, I'm telling you why. It has to do with their relationship with Christ. Jesus is the source of life. No one ever passed by Jesus and did not receive a touch of life. And you came today in this place, the church, Sunday morning, Christians. And you're thinking that you just perform your religious duty. But I have good news for you. Jesus is passing by. And you will feel his touch. And his touch always comes with life. No matter how bad was your week, there is life in this place. Now, we have to consider also this idea that someone once said that, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you what you are. If you want to be happy, joyful, blessed, you must eat from Jesus. When I say that, I'm referring to John chapter 6 now. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has overflowing Zoe life. I am the bread of life. Now he's comparing. He says, I want you to nourish yourself from me. I am the bread of life. Yeah, your fathers, the Jews, the Israelites, they ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. So they ate the natural bread and still they die. Verse 50, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that no one may eat of it and not die. So Jesus is saying he is this source of life that brings endless life. 51, I am the living bread came down from heaven, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. In other texts, you're going to say that the drink is his blood. It's strange when you listen for the first time, but you understand because, I'm sorry, I love, I really love, I'm not, I'm not joking I really like American food. I know some of you guys say that he's just saying this just to conquer the, the audience. But it is true. I like it. Sweet barbecue. I like Latino churrasco, carne asada. But I like, I like barbecue sauce. And, but we have to be honest. We live in a day and age that uh, there's so much stuffing food that makes you full but not satisfied. Do you guys agree with me? Like you eat, 
You feel like you really feel your belly full, but you're not satisfied. I remember traveling with my wife um, to Denver area, Colorado, and I don't know why, what reason there. They are all organic, natural food. And sometimes they, we order, you know, a plate, and usually uh, we like to share because we really don't eat much. So there we, we order food, and different from Florida, the south, the plates were smaller. But they were well-made plates. So, I, so, but the size of the meal, I wonder, that, that would not satisfy us. Like both of us, maybe I should order a plate just for me. But we start to share. And incredibly, even though it was a smaller amount of food, we were both really satisfied and even had some leftovers. Bec even though it was less food. So now, you understand the difference of being full and satisfied. You guys with me? Are you guys with me? Everybody knows, right? So Jesus is saying there is a food. There is a meal. There is a bread. They're not going to stuff you up. But it will bring satisfaction. There is a food, a meal, that can make you really satisfied. And Jesus is saying what it is. It is the gospel, the message. The daily encounter with the reality that Jesus poured his blood for my sins and he suffered in his flesh for my iniquities. Oh, I remember listening to that, Pastor, in the last Easter I visited a church. No, 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 no. I'm saying it has to be a daily meal. Jesus is saying my flesh and my blood is true bread and true drink. That means that when we are reminded we sang about that today. When we are reminded that the blood was enough to make me righteous in this permanent state of righteousness. And also by the suffering on his flesh, I can expect unlimited blessings for my life. And I should feed my soul every single day from his blood and from his flesh. I am genuinely satisfied the source of life is jesus himself the source of life is eating from this sacrifice the shedding of the blood the suffering on the flesh the awareness of that truth and that brings overflowing life but there is more in the same context of john chapter 6 Jesus makes another, for many, crazy affirmation. He said that, verse, six, uh, verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. Would you repeat that with me? Say with me, the Spirit. Spirit. Say again, the Spirit, Spirit. who gives life. So, first Jesus said that He came to give life, overflowing, abundant life. Then he said that his sacrifice, the awareness of his sacrifice, the conscience of righteousness by his sacrifice gives me life. But now he's also affirming that the Spirit gives life. And then he keeps saying the flesh is no help at all. Your strength, your effort, your uh, willpower is not enough. You don't have a source of life in yourself. And I know you really try. You try to change your husband. You're trying to convince your wife. She has to change her life, Pastor. I'm just trying to help her life. Yeah, but for your information, your flesh has no help at all. Come on, somebody. You should at your age realize that already. But if you don't, I'm here just to remind you. Your flesh has no help at all. We cannot give and change anyone's life. But the Spirit can. The Spirit really can change your children. And Jesus keeps saying, the words that I have spoken to you are a spirit in life. So Jesus added in this brief verse here, two sources of life. He says, the Spirit and the Word. 
Say with me, the Spirit and the Word. Now we learn these when we open our Bibles. You barely started reading the Holy Scripture. And there you find out that this is true. That everything that God does, He does by His Spirit and by His Word. Let's take a look on Genesis chapter 1. And the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Chaos. There was chaos. No, there was no order in the beginning. But the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit. The Spirit was active, was moving, was hovering upon the chaos. And then, verse 3, God said. Say with me, spirit, spirit. and word. Spirit. Say to somebody, spirit and word. Spirit. That's, that's how life flows. That's how life moves. So you come to your home, and you are noticing that the atmosphere at home is heavy. It's burdened. It's, it's just strange. Kids fighting, argumenting, husband complaining, wives unsatisfied, just heavy loaded, life sucking environment. Wait, wait a minute, what should I do? What should I do to change this dying, this slaining, this death atmosphere into an overflowing life? I don't want my house in 2023 be a place of death, a graveyard. No, 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 no. I want my house to be a playground full of joy. Yeah, they may cry, they may fight, but it's still full of life. Come on, somebody. I want my, ho my house to be a party, an environment with a feast every single day. What should I do then? That's what Jesus said us to do. Let's bring the Spirit and the Word. He worked in the beginning. He still works today. Let me prove that to you guys. And now I'm uh, making analogy to my wife's preaching in this conference. By the way, if you didn't watch her, it was the best message ever preached. It was really, really amazing. She preached on Ezekiel. So I want to invite you to the same text that she shared the Word. Ezekiel chapter 37. And... We have prophet Ezekiel looking to the discouraged, downcasted nation of Israel. Ezekiel, different than Jeremiah, he was exiled with the people. He went together with the first group of Judeans to uh, Babylon, Babylon. And he didn't see hope in anyone's face. And in the midst of that discouragement, he probably was at the bank of a river, a Babylonian river, missing the, the smell, the taste of Judah land, the promised land. Maybe he was throwing on that river, you know, that rocks just to see them uh, jumping and, and bouncing in the river, but just regretting to be there as a slave. And the Lord opens the vision. His prophetic vision to Ezekiel. And he sees this valley of dry bones. We all know this story. And God speaks to him saying, look Ezekiel, these dry bones are like the people of Israel. They have no life in themselves. So much like some homes here. You go to your house and you see that valley of dry bones. Yes, you remember Psalm 23. It says, even when I went, even when I passed through the valley of the shadow of death, even there the good shepherd stands his staff and rod and comforts me. But you don't seem that you're passing. It seems that you made a camp there. You are living in that horrible valley of the shadow of death. And, and you don't like it. You are in the valley of dry bones. What should you do? Today I want to awake the Ezekiels in this house, all the prophets in this house. You can change the atmosphere of your business. 
you can determine life in your life group. By the way, that's one of the reasons we call life group. It's not a small group. It's not book group. It's not Bible group. It's life group. Because when we gather, everybody should leave the meeting overflowing life. <laughs> spilling over life. So the prophet sees that vision and he's discouraged. He says, I know that, God. What should I do? And God reminds Ezekiel what I'm trying to remind you today. Bring the spirit through the word. Bring the spirit through the word. Verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. And the word breath, ruah, spirit. Prophesy so the spirit moves. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds. O oh, spirit of God, O oh, breath of God, oh, and breathe on these is lain that they may live. Verse 10, I love that. So I prophesy as he commanded me. And the spirit, the breath came into them. And they lived and they stood on their feet. An exceedingly great army. Say a good amen in this house. So I, I know what you are facing right now in your marriage. Dry bones. No hope. No way out. Yeah, the legal system give their way out, but you still can prophesy. And, and I know this is such a practical thing to do. Like you should test that. This is the type of message that you can go home right now and try it out. See if speaking the word of God, literally sometimes even reading out loud one psalm out loud in your home as you walk. You're in the kitchen, you're in the bedrooms, you're in the living room. You still just... Just careful so you don't stumble in anything. But keep reading one of the Psalms out loud. See if the atmosphere of your home is not going to change. Just try it out. I like what Ezekiel says. I just, I just did it. I just prophesied. And it worked. Life came over the slain. Life came over the dead ones. By the opening of the mouth of the prophet. When you come... Back to your workplace. Prophesy. Every time. When the Spirit of God. Meets the Word of God. Through your mouth. Life is generated. Every time. Now there's something else I need to point out. I couldn't resist. Because as you keep reading. This passage in Ezekiel. You have a prelude in the, in the Old Testament about the New Covenant. Now, the New Covenant is the greatest blessing God could ever give to His children. It is in Hebrews chapter 8 and quotes Jeremiah chapter 32, but also makes reference of Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm saying this because... The new covenant is our message. Pastor John just said this. That's my only calling. Is to remind you that God is in love with you. That God doesn't need to prove his love anymore. Because he proved with the maximum of proof he could ever give. And he could only give us as a promise. But he's bound himself into a covenant. An everlasting covenant. But I know that the only way someone will actually get the new covenant is if the Holy Spirit brings revelation. And every Sunday morning, to not say every morning, that's my prayer for you. That whenever we will open the scripture, we're going to, Read the Bible. We're going to share a message for you. The Spirit of God will open the eyes of your heart to see the beauty, the amazing, the fantastic truth of the new covenant. I pray that this morning. 
I really restrained myself even from eating so I could be even more intense in my prayer. So you could have the revelation of this truth. And I'm going to share once again about the new covenant. But now in the book of Ezekiel, look what it says, verse 26. I will make a covenant of peace with them. Listen, God, He has a plan of peace for you. God, I like to say this word, is conspiring for your good. I know I, you need to understand the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's, that's Satan's job. But I came to give you peace, overflowing life. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set them in their land and multiply them. And I'll set my sanctuary in their midst forever. You know... The Jews, the Israelites, they never experienced that. And the apostles understood God was speaking about us, the church. Verse 27 says, my dwelling place shall be with them. And I'll be their God. And they shall be my people. You know why you are here this morning? Because you belong to him. He called you unto salvation, but more than that, he called you into a relationship. When I speak of overflowing life, I'm speaking life that touches your past, life that affects your present, and life that brings amazing hope for the future. It has to be like this. It's not just for the immediate needs or for the heavenly promises. It is past, present, and future. After all, life is made of experiences that we carry from the past, moments in the present, and plans for the future. But the type of life the Zoe has for his children is abundant life, affecting every moment, timing. So regarding your past, what backgrounds you make your life right now, may be brought to you into this depression state. You look back and you regret. You know your mistakes. So you live under condemnation. In your present, because of your past, you can't see a bright future. Your wrong paths. But the good news, 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, anyone here is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. So what about you make a resolution to not drive your life anymore looking to the rear view mirror? Let's, let's expect new things. The old has passed away. You have the new. The new has come. From your past, past, only sweet memories will stand. Because I don't want to erase all my past. There are things in my past that I like to remember. That's why we take pictures. That's why we, we like to talk about the flavors of our childhood, right? Our experiences with people that we felt love. But what could mean an overflow of life for your present? It can be a life with anxiety. It cannot be a life with distress, doubts. For me, an overflowing life for my present means a life with wisdom. Let's read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. How many of us are in Christ Jesus again? You notice the emphasis, right? It's about him. He is the source. And if I am abiding in him, I have abundance of life. And in my present, Christ became to us wisdom from God. Thank you, Jesus. Wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that it is written, let the one 
who boast, boast in the Lord. The Greek word for wisdom is Sophia. Sophia. Has a broad meaning. Take a look. Listen. It means full of intelligence. Any high schoolers here struggling math? Come on. Receive intelligence. Wisdom. Knowledge of things of man and things of God. Capacity to learn. Oh, I need that, Jesus. Capacity to learn. The gift of interpreting dreams. And the meaning of mysterious visions. I do need that too. Every single week somebody sends me my WhatsApp a mysterious vision to interpret. I, I can't do that. I need wisdom. It also means the skill to manage many affairs. Oh, I need that too, Jesus. I do need that. This is, I, it's more than multitask. Is, I don't know even the name of task I need to manage. Wisdom means the skill to impart the truth. To unwrap the truth. I do need wisdom, Jesus. Supreme intelligence, such as belonging to God. For my present, overflowing life means wisdom. I need wisdom for today. To have answers that in my own background, family raising, my academic formation, I, don't, I know I don't have it, but with the wisdom of God. I can't answer the problems of today. Dealing with the future, an overflowing life means nothing else but hope. So enough with preoccupation. You know, that's the, the Hispanic and the Portuguese word for worry, for stress. We don't use much the word stress in Spanish and in Portuguese. You use the word preoccupation. You are so preoccupied, which it's easy to define. You are pre, before it happens, occupied with a problem that may not be a problem. But you are filling your brain, your soul with that possible problem, that potential problem, that maybe because you are preoccupied will be a problem. Did you guys get what I'm saying? It wasn't a problem. It was just a potential problem. But now your stress, your harsh words, your lack of patience with your children is creating the problem. Enough with preoccupation. Don't fill yourself with worries that are not true. How can we do that, Pastor? How dare the... You can read this in all the apostolic writings. Dare to say... Do not be anxious. Like, it seems it is a command. But I don't have control when I notice I wake up and suddenly my cell phone have this rush of notifications that, you know, just over, overwhelm me with this adrenaline and this cortisol that makes my brain accelerated. Instead of me expecting good things, I only live every day preoccupied. Enough with that. Because in the overflowing life, we have a living hope. First Peter, I'll end with that. First Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Kind of, not end now. First Peter 1, 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Say amen. amen. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy that has caused us to be born again. To be in Christ. Born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Look, if you were extremely rich. Listen. If you had no financial problems right now listen to my voice this is life i said about abundance of life what are you guys are expecting right i said we prefer to be a playground so what are you expecting any other sound in this room <laughs> this is the word being being true right now but listen to me 
Uh, if you had no worry for your bills of tomorrow, if you knew that you have more than enough to pay all your financial challenges right now, would you be worried? Would you be stressed? Would you be preoccupied right now in this beautiful Sunday morning? Probably not. So let me read it again, First Peter. And I want you to, as we are reading, start to fill your heart with this truth. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy that has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We were born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. You don't have only enough. You have overflowing life. Overflowing resources. And I know that Jesus said that we may face tribulation in this world. You're quoting John chapter 16. That says, I have said these things that you may, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now listen, listen. I know in the middle of the verse we have in the world you have tribulation. But you cannot isolate that. Because in the sandwich of this verse says, I want you to have peace. And I want you to have your heart encouraged. Take heart. So why we're reading this verse as a, as a reasoning for us to worry. Why we're taking this Bible verse as an argument to create a, a, an unbiblical logic. Yeah, you know, we have to face tribulation. So I know what's expecting me for tomorrow. No! Have peace for tomorrow. Take heart for tomorrow. That's his goal in saying that. He's not, in other words, we don't deny the reality. We just leave above that reality that may crush us. I love the message version of this verse that says, I've told you all this so that trusting me, you'll be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. Say amen, everybody. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. The is godless world. What are you expecting from the world? Tap on your back? Complimenting you to believe in Christ? No, they will persecute us but take heart i've conquered the world hallelujah every morning make this resolution i'll pray to god i'll surrender to him my worries i'll cast on jesus all my anxieties and i'll wait for his action New Living Translation of Psalm 5.3. Listen to my voice in the morning. The psalmist is praying. Lord, each morning I'll bring my request to you and I'll wait expectantly. I'll wait your goodness. I'll wait blessings to come to my life. The type of life God has for us is abundant. Overflow. We start this message reading John 10.10. And this whole conversation started after Jesus healed a blind man. Let me invite you to stand up right now as I close. Worship team. So it's really interesting because Jesus said such a statement. I came to give life, overflowing Zoe. After healing a blind man from birth. He was blind since he came to life. He was blind and therefore he could not see colors, beauty. He could feel it maybe by his touch, but no doubt one of the senses that makes life enjoyable the most is sight. 
So here lies a condition for us to enter into this abundance life, abundance of life, overflowing life. I'm reading John chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that the religious leaders had cast the blind man, now heal blind man, had cast him out among them. And had found him, Jesus said to the former blind man, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir? Look, he was from the south, right? But he's not calling Jesus Lord yet. He's calling Jesus Sir. Who? I, I couldn't see him. I don't know who even healed me. Because when he healed me, he put this mud made of saliva in my eyes. And he ordered me to go into that specific pool, that specific water spring to, to wash my face. Now I am seen, but I, I don't know who healed me. So who is the healer? Who is the Son of Man? Who is the Savior? Who is the Messiah that I can believe in him. Verse 37. Jesus said to him. You have seen him. And it is he. Who is speaking to you. From sir. To lord. That blind man called Jesus. Lord. And said the essential phrase. For you to receive. Abundance of life. I believe. 